Hey YouTube, this is JD, and uh, I'm back doing another video with the Isolated Queen Pawn, and we're going to continue looking at sacrifices on h6. Uh, today's game is uh, slightly different because it's going to demonstrate what happens if, or what can happen, if black decides to try to decline the sacrifice on h6. So going into the game, we get to, uh, started out as a Karo Khan, and then quickly led to the Panam Botvinnik, which is the typical way of uh, getting an Isolated Queen Pawn in the Karo Khan. But as we saw in an earlier game, it's not the only way. So knight f6, knight c3, just standard development here. And uh, here we've already gotten the uh, isolated queen pawn, and white begins to set up uh, the standard type of setup against the isolated queen's pawn. The bishop c4, queen e2, castles, this bishop usually will come out to g5 and bring his rooks to the center. Uh, but immediately black jumps back to f6 which Baburn says that this move is too passive and just gives white a complete free hand to develop his initiative on the king side. And the problem, he says, is that there was no real reason to bring this knight back to f6 because this bishop's still on c4, which means it's not generating any pressure against h7, so there's no real need to defend that yet. Instead, black should have probably developed uh, some pressure against the d4 pawn, maybe knight c6 or something like that might have been more prudent. Uh, but we just get castles and castles, and queen e2, and then now knight bd7, and rook d1. So after knight b6, uh, white decides to drop his bishop back to d3. Now it's possible to play back to b3 with ideas of knight g5 and knight e5. Uh, we've seen this kind of a setup before with this attack against the f7 e6 square, but this is another way to play. So knight bd5, and now knight e5. And uh, just bishop d7. Now queen f3, which is an interesting interesting idea and sort of introduces a new concept into our the sacrifices we're looking at on h6. The idea is that he's going to put his queen on h3, which is a typical idea of combining a, an attack on h6. The, the problem here for black is that this bishop and this queen coordinate well against h7, and after bishop to g5, he's going to be forced to make some sort of concession on his king side, either g6 or h6. The other thing to note about this queen on h3 is that in some line, it's going to be well placed to attack the e6 square here. Um, so we see here uh, this knight capture, and then it retakes with the pawn which is just going to solidify this. And then we see bishop a4, which is a mistake. Uh, it brings the queen away, f or excuse me, not the queen, brings the bishop away from the king side, specifically a defense of this e6 square. And it really just drives the white rook to a, a better and more active square where he's going to have an easier time getting a rook lift or supporting an attack on the square that the bishop conveniently just left behind. Uh, just noting also, uh, for any of you who wanted to, this pawn is not capturable. After just this, uh, white's happy to pick up an exchange. So uh, let's not let's not do that. So instead, he played bishop a4, as we said, and we're just going to bring the rook over to e1. And now rook e8 and uh, bishop g5, creating this sort of pressure against h7 now, is going to force some sort of a response. In the game, uh, white chose to play h6. But it was possible and perhaps better to play g6. However, uh, in the event now, white is just going to shift his attack to this e6 and f7 square. He's going to start with just bishop to b7. Then after something like knight to d7, he gets to take advantage of this b file here. And black already has quite a few problems to solve. Note that before the bishop dropped back here, uh, we're already threatening to take on f7, and after the king takes, uh, we can even take with the bishop, and we're going to pick up an exchange and have these two pawns, not to mention the fact that his king is going to be pretty terminally weak. Uh, if you're interested in this sort of attacking setup, you should check out some of my earlier videos where we explored this idea quite a lot. Uh, but as I said, instead of playing g6, uh, black chose to play h6. And so, if we compare this position to the one from the Kamsky game that we just looked at, where he captured on h6, we see some sort of key differences. Um, if you remember, in the Kamsky game, this bishop was on d6, and this queen was on a5, which allowed this sacrifice on h6 because it was going to weaken the h6 square and gave black 
quite a difficult time handling with this pressure against f6, which then caused problems after he was forced to play f5. Um, here, white, re or excuse me, black only really has one sort of misplaced piece. So it seems that maybe, maybe all the conditions aren't really there that we talked about in the last game. But there's some differences in the white camp as well. If you remember, Kamsky's bishop, uh, uh, excuse me, yeah, his bishop was over on a2, so it was not yet on this diagonal where it wanted to be. And this really nice looking knot in e5, well, Kamsky's was on e2. So to offset the fact that black's defenses are probably somewhat better set up to handle this attack, so are whites. So I think that that's going to cancel out and uh, decides that uh, this is just a key sacrifice and is really going to work really well here. Um, black really can't even accept it. Uh, if he plays the the sort of just the the standard, just trying to, to take the material and run with it and hold on, well, even just now, the immediate rook to e3. Uh, note that if you try to take the pawn immediately, bishop f8 is going to create some problems. The bishop will be able to come over in the way, and this is going to free the queen to come out as well, too. So we're not going to take that pawn just yet. But after something like h5, trying to keep the h file closed since this knight now defends, just rook g3, and after king f8, we get a really cool looking move. Just rook f3 back, keeping in touch with this king, and not allowing this knight to move anymore. So after bishop to d6, just trying to create a hole for his king to escape, and hoping to get rid of the super strong knight, we get a really awesome looking sacrifice. Just queen takes h5. Now, obviously, we can't take the queen because of rook takes f7 and we're forcing the king over here to g8. And then bishop h7, forcing it in the corner. And then knight g6 is going to deliver the goods there. So we can't take it. Uh, so instead, we lop off this knight. But after bishop h7, excuse me, not bishop h7, <laughs> queen h6, we get king to e7. And now d takes e5. And again, this knight can't move. So, which means that white is going to get his all of his material back that he's invested and just have a couple extra pawns, plus this king is in shambles. Uh, if he does try to save the knight, well, then we just sacrifice the rook, and then we get a really typical mating pattern here. Uh, the king can't go to e7 because g7 is just a mate, but then this is just a quick mate too. So, we see that taking the, taking the bishop outright is going to fail pretty quickly. So that means that uh, black needs to come up with some other kind of defense. And uh, he has an interesting idea in the game that I think, I think is, is nice, but ultimately, ultimately failing. So first he captures here on c6. So leaving white with the idea, with the option of, do I just want to drop my bishop back and just be happy that I've opened the h file? No, we can't do that. No, we just capture this. And now he's forced to take the bishop. Uh, if he chooses not to, uh, we're just going to go down and mate him on h8. So he has to grab the bishop now. Um, but then we get this rook lift. And uh, rook g3 is just a devastating threat. Uh, so black comes up with a pretty interesting and unique idea. First he gives back some material, just which is going to take out this bishop so that he doesn't have this attacker. And then after the rook captures back, he plays bishop to c2. And his idea is he's going to come plant this bishop on g6 and try to blunt the attack that way. But we'll see this is a pretty short-lived idea. So we get rook g3 and now bishop g6, which was the idea. But after another sacrifice on g6, bam, we notice that there are no more defenders of this g6 square. The queen's just going to walk over to g3, and uh, this guy's just going to fall, and there's going to be some terminal threats here of the knight and queen teaming up together. And uh, there's really no more defenders of the of the black camp. Really only this knight and anything else is going to take some time. So we get queen to g3. And already we have some pretty serious threats. The threat is just to capture here on g6. After the king goes back to g7, going to f8 just allows mate. Um, well, we find that knight to f7 also is mate. And we're going to win the queen to boot. So that forces rook to f8. And then we capture here, he jumps back into the corner, and now rook d1. Our idea, of course, is to hold this pawn, but also to play rook d3 and then bring the rook over to the h file when it looks like it's lights out. 
So Black decides that he wants to try to trade the queens, but now we get my favorite move of the game. This is just such a subtle, quick, just a, such a subtle, awesome idea. We just get rook to b1, which you're like, what is that about? Well, I think that uh, the best way to sort of explain is just to look through the variations. Um, so if we look at just the immediate rook to d3, we see that uh, he's just going to trade queens. We take here, and after king g7, we can come try to win this knight. Or sorry, not the one knight, but try to win the bishop. But after king g7, the knight's trapped. Can't go here, can't go here, here, or here. And he's just going to win the knight. And we've only got two pawns for the for the knight. So he comes up with this ingenious idea of uh, going to b1 with the rook. And if we look at the difference now, now if we capture the queen, we get this. The king comes to g7, and we come here and try to do the same thing as before. Well, now he has this just defending the knight. Okay, so that's that's clearly bad because uh, not only have we got our piece back, we've picked up an extra pawn and we're probably going to get this one too at some point. So that's not going to work. So we get the, the game continuation, which honestly only works marginally better. He plays b6. Okay, well, we're going to go ahead and lift our rook, which essentially forces him to go for this queen trade now. Uh, if, for example, he tries not to give the, the bishop up here, tries to play like knight h7, that's okay. We just get rook g3. Again, if he trades the queens, we're just going to take and then win this bishop. Notice now, since he was forced to play b6, we have access to the c6 square now. This was the key point of this rook b1, is to try to force b6 so that c6 is clear. But uh, if, so if, if, if black tries to avoid this, this giving up of the bishop with something like knight g5, notice that uh, we're threatening mate here, and rook g8 just allows knight f7, and he's got to give up the queen. So that's not possible. So knight g5 is the only other try to hang on to the material. But after queen h6+, plus, and uh, we come here, he's going to get it back anyway because of the pen here, and the queens are still on the board. So this is probably a much worse scenario than uh, than the previous one so instead instead of this h7 he goes ahead and trades the queens uh, but we get this and after the he picks up the bishop here uh, king f7 just knight c6 uh, which uh, really shows why this king or sorry not king but rook to b1 was such an awesome idea just really subtle we're looking at all of this king side attacking business and black, white takes the time to decide he needs the c6 square completely on the other side of the board really cool this is totally about playing on the whole board here full board awareness right so uh really exciting game uh after he's gained back his material there's no significant threats from black everything's comfortable black says you know what i'm not going to suffer being a two pound a two pawn down in game where you're just gonna bleed me to death and these guys are just gonna walk up the board so he decided to go ahead and call it a day here so I like to go back and uh, as always just sort of review the key moment where they made that decision to sacrifice on h6 so if we look back into those moves where was that at let's see here yeah it was move 19 this sacrifice so we look at this I think the more key in this game than in the previous one is not so much how misplaced the black army is, but how well placed the white one is. This queen on h3, the bishop already on this diagonal, the knight is on e5, and he has quick access to lift a rook into it as well. I, I think that that's really the key factors here is how how active the white army is, and uh, black is just not able to compensate for that activity especially in this line where he went ahead and captured it we saw the rook lift immediately uh, this was just brutal <coughs> playing this check and then this really kind of cool idea which involves the the queen sacrifice this is just spicy guys really enjoy this we're threatening mate immediately which basically forces him to capture here this is a really nice idea but uh, I think that it's a, it would be key if you can sort of try to commit this piece formation into mind of uh, all of these active pieces. He's got four, five active pieces that are all sort of uh, either either directly attacking the king or will very quickly be attacking the king. Uh, and uh, yeah, really nice game, guys.
Hope you enjoyed this and found it as cool and as instructive as I did. And uh, we'll see you guys later. Make sure you leave me a comment. Make sure you subscribe. And, uh, and uh, have a nice day. Thanks, guys. Bye-bye.